recap, Pastor Jeremy and I hope that you come to realize over time that, uh, and through uh, overt teaching, that our worship is a journey through the very Word of God. I have said this before, um, while there is uh, value in, say, shooting from the hip in leading worship, I'd say that there is greater weight when that worship leadership is clearly rooted in the Word of God. And great effort every week is expended to demonstrate to you visually in your worship guide just where every element of worship is rooted in the Word of God. I'll speak to more of that later. But if you are a guest with us today, I welcome you, we welcome you. And by way of that brief uh, statement, you are now oriented to how we at the First Presbyterian Church of Bakerstown worship. We have been in a sermon series on the Gospel of Matthew. We started this in January. And Matthew, by way of introduction, is a Jewish man who was also employed by the Roman Empire, Emperor, Empire to be a tax collector for Rome. And so as a Jewish man working for the Roman government, taking cash from his fellow people, he was not very, he wasn't very well liked. I'll just say tax collect, Jewish tax collectors were not among the favorite people of Israel. So it was a, it was a middleman job. It was a tough job. The system, how, how is it that a, a man could uh, devote himself to a vocation that would take money from his peers and give it to an oppressive regime? How is it that a Jewish man could do that? Well, there was a, 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 a motivation system in the compensation for tax collectors. You see, tax collectors extracted taxes from their citizens, and then as uh, the tax collectors were permitted to add a fee, like handling fee, for, you know, for you to pay your taxes. And, uh, and that fee was something that the tax collector could set. So if you were friends with a tax collector, you might get a wink and a nod and a lower fee. But if you cross the path, of a tax collector in such a way that you, you uh, made him unhappy, the next time you see him, he just may charge you more for your fee. And so tax collectors were known, Jewish tax collectors were known for taking advantage of people and enriching their own pockets. So Matthew a Jewish tax collector meets Jesus and answers Jesus' call to follow him. That's kind of a, a scandalous person to have in your peer group. I'm sure that the other disciples didn't look kindly on Matthew. I'm sure that they, they, they interacted with him in a uh, pensive way maybe even a judgmental way. But Jesus stood with him. Loved him. Called him to a higher purpose than collecting taxes. Jesus called Matthew to be a disciple and to be a disciple maker. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to record his telling of the good news of Jesus, and we call this the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book of the New Testament in our Bibles. 
A while back, uh, you were taught that in the Gospel of Matthew, a major theme of his gospel is, is pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment of Jewish scriptures. And so in the uh, telling of the good news of Jesus Christ to Matthew, it was essential to have in view and to have knowledge of the Jewish scriptures. These included the five books of Moses. These included the books of history. And in the books of history would be recorded God's covenants with Abraham, with Noah, with Adam, Noah, Abraham, and David. In addition to the, the books of Moses and the books of history, there would also be the books of wisdom, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and the book of Job. There would also be the collection of the prophets, many prophets. And of course, the hymn book of Israel, the book of Psalms. Matthew, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, presented the, the good news of Jesus, showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that had been spoken by God to his people and recorded in the scriptures by many other writers in different times and in different locations in the the people of Israel, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. So Jesus being the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures is an important and essential, essential theme in his telling about Jesus. So in January, we began this series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we started, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And last week, we ended in chapter 7. Pastor Jeremy concluded uh, the section, the three chapters that are called the Sermon on the Mount. And I must tell you that though I worshiped at Element Church in Millville in the morning, afternoon passed, we had lunch with family, in the evening, I opened up the worship and worshiped from home with you. I heard Pastor Jeremy's sermon. And I must say this. I would call it a watershed sermon for the life of the First Presbyterian Church of Bakerstown. It was that clear. It was that strong. I ended, you know, watching the live stream with a sense of peace. That there is a generation coming up behind us that loves Jesus, that there is a generation coming up behind us that seeks to be obedient to our Lord Jesus, that there is a generation behind us that knows the absolute truth of Scripture and proclaims it clearly and without reserve, without apology, without seeking to be like by the likes of men, but seeking only to please, to please the Lord. I listened to that sermon two more times this past week. I could listen to it again and again and again. It was a strong conclusion to the section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And today we would be starting chapter 8. But we're not going there. We're going to fast forward the TV and go to chapter 21. 
Here, Jesus. Jesus comes to the city of Jerusalem and he passes through the gates. Jerusalem is a walled city and you can only enter it through the gates of that walled city, the gates that would close the city off for security reasons and be open to let worshipers and citizens and other nations in and out of the city. In chapter 21, Jesus passes through the gates of Jerusalem and makes his way to the temple. Remember, this is the city that was once decimated by the Babylonians, including the temple. The city and the temple were decimated by the Babylonians. This was the city and the temple that was rebuilt. Jerusalem was the heart of Jewish identity. It was the center of their worship. It was the definitive place for their life as a nation. And at the center of the city, yes, was the temple. The temple where God was present and worshipped. And so now, we come to the reading of God's word. In Matthew 21. As they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them, and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this day. And we pray that your spirit would keep our eyes and hearts open to the truth concerning you in the scriptures that we would be reminded again and affirmed again who we are to you. And for all who are seeking you, Lord Jesus, may, may your spirit work 
in their hearts today to draw them to you, to profess with their lips that you are their Savior from sin, that you are their Lord of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want you for a moment to take your worship guides. I want to point out some things to you as a as a way of teaching about worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Bakerstown. I think uh, we have demonstrated for you today that this is a map that leads you on a journey, leads your heart and your minds on a journey through the Word of God so that you could know the character of God, how to access a relationship with God and be sent with purpose by the call of God. That's what the order of service is in service to. It's in service of bringing pleasure and joy to the Lord that we might see with our minds and our hearts his kingdom. Some of you have been around way longer than me here. And uh, if you're new here, or if you hang out with us enough, you're going to hear other people saying, what? You know what I'm going to say? What? Say it. Be bold. It's a... Uh, there you go. Don't say that lightly. Don't ever say that lightly. Say it knowing the full truth concerning that statement. Because when you say it's a great day in the kingdom, and I'm certain it was taught to you with this certitude. When we say it's a great day in the kingdom, we are revealing to the person to whom we are speaking to that we see something that they may not see. And if it's a fellow brother or sister in Christ, they will see what we see. We see the kingdom of God. But if it is an unbeliever, that statement will reveal to that person what we see. We see the kingdom of God. And you can only see the kingdom of God through the lens of faith in Christ. Being the son of God, fully God, fully human. You can only say that truth. It's a great day in the kingdom. Knowing that his kingdom is both established. His kingdom is advancing. No matter what you see going on in the media. No matter what you hear is going on in our culture. We know that, that the kingdom has come. John the Baptist proclaimed it. We heard that in Matthew chapter 3. It's here, it's advancing, and it is yet to come in its full fullness. So when you say it's a great day in the kingdom, do not ever say that lightly. Say it with the full force of your faith in that biblical truth. As time goes on, we're to continue growing deeper in following Christ. We're to continue to grow deeper in our knowledge about the worship of God. We are to continue growing deeper in our expression of worship before a holy God. That's what this map represents. And you heard at the very beginning of worship the prophetic setting for the day that we remember in Matthew 21. Matthew acknowledges that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. 
Zechariah's words, yes, spoke to the context of the Israelites, Israelites 500 years before Christ. It spoke to the Babylonian conquest. It spoke to the, the, uh, the coming and the proclamation of King Cyrus of Persia, who on one level was the king that Zechariah prophesied, but Zechariah prophesied, yes, king of Persia, but that king of Persia would point to, would foreshadow, would foretell the coming of the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And so prophecy has this strange dimension of speaking directly to the people in the time that the word is spoken, but prophecy also looks beyond what earthly eyes can see to direct spiritual eyes to the kingdom, to the king. And so people of faith can see two things at the same time. And weeks ago, I encouraged you to keep your eye on the king. Take your eye off whatever media outlet that you are cons- may be consumed by, whatever social network that you might be consumed by, whatever political dilemma that you might be consumed by, or financial threat you may be consumed by, and keep your eye on Christ, the King. Keep your eye and your hope on the coming kingdom which will be here no matter what you see with your eyes on this earth. It is coming. So if we were to see the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem through his eyes, he would have known the prophecy of Zechariah. And he would have known walking through the gates into the city of Jerusalem that he was the fulfillment of words spoken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, one more hundred, years ago. Did the people around him see that? No. We see in our scripture lesson that they were like, well, who is this guy? And some people had an answer because with what their eyes, what they saw was, well, this is a prophet from, you know, that podunk town called Nazareth. It was a biblical version of our West Virginia joke. You see, there's two ways of seeing the world. There's seeing the world as God sees it, and then there's everything else. Jesus entered this city knowing full well, seeing very clearly the absolute truth of existence, of reality. You see, the things of this world are, are, will be crumbled to dust. Rust and moth will consume it. At the end and fulfillment of all time, everything that consumes your thoughts and causes you worry and anxiety will go away. And the only thing that will remain is eternity with God, with his people, worshiping. Jesus entered this city knowing that he was a fulfillment of words spoken generations before. Jesus also entered this city knowing the hymnody of the people of Israel, knowing the the lyrics to the songs that, that the people of Israel sang in worship, Psalm 118, from which our call to worship is taken from, is the psalm that is associated with the observation, the the, uh, celebration of Palm Sunday. It's the Palm Sunday psalm. So Jesus not only knew the words of the prophet, he also knew the, the, the verse of the poets, whose verse was put to song. And King David, 
who penned these words and the people of Israel who sang these words said, Open to me the gates of righteousness. This was the yearning and hope of the people, the covenant people of God, the people of Israel. That in spite of all of the world's troubles and anxieties, and despite all of the world's blessings, none of that can surpass the glory of God. None of that can surpass pure righteousness. That's glory. So in your worship guide, you have the words of the prophet. You have the words of the poet. The words in Scripture, whether they are read or the words in Scripture that are sung or the words in Scripture that are proclaimed from this pulpit or the words of Scripture that are demonstrated in the sacrament of baptism or the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. These are all means of grace by which we abide in Christ. These are all means by which we are reminded of our salvation in Christ. These are all means by which we are nurtured in our life pursuing holiness. So our worship takes us to the reading of Matthew 21, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And Jesus enters the city. Yes, he saw that he was a fulfillment of prophetic words. Yes, he saw that he was the, the fulfillment of the desires of a worshiping people, singing people. But when he approached the city of Jerusalem, what most people saw were, was a wall with buildings inside, buildings with purpose, a marketplace, residences, places of business. What, G, what people normally saw was a temple constructed by human hands according to the decree of God and how to build that temple. What the people saw was a place that secured or, or defined their national identity. What people saw was the residence of God at the temple in the center of that city on a hill. Did Jesus see that? Yes, he had human eyes to see that. And yes, he had full knowledge of, of how we as a human being can see reality. But he also saw, because he's fully God, he also saw a Jerusalem that only John was afforded the gift of revelation in seeing. John in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 revealed his vision of the new Jerusalem. So Jerusalem at his time was a foreshadowing of the final culmination of the kingdom of God at the end of time, at the end of judgment, a new Jerusalem. And in that new Jerusalem, there would be no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, and no more sin. No more brokenness. No more death in the new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, John saw the temple. The earthly Jerusalem, the earthly temple, there's a huge gap between what is earthly and what is spiritual, spiritually real. 
Jeremy spoke to you earlier about our holiness and God's holiness. We might be able to, you know, put notches in our belt of some good things that we did that we think are in response and obedience to Christ. But sometimes, well, what Isaiah tells us is that our hearts are corrupt and even our good deeds, and the Apostle Paul reinforces this, even our good deeds are uh, shaded by our own motives and our own sin. We can never live in goodness like Christ get, lives. So there is a gap in our attempts at righteousness and holiness and God's righteousness and holiness. So it is with the city of Jerusalem. So it is with the temple in the city of Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, the new temple is, there's no comparison. So Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem in chapter 21. And though his human eyes see what everybody else sees, his spiritual eyes see what's ahead and what's coming. His spiritual eyes see what he is calling you to see. What he is calling you to live for. What he is calling you to treasure with all of your heart. So when Jesus stands at the gates of the city of Jerusalem, he sees the hope of the songs of Israel. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Open the gates to me, the gates of righteousness. So how are we to close the gap between what we see with our eyes and what we know in faith? How is it that Jesus is the fulfillment of the hope of Israel that the gates of righteousness would be open. It's Jesus himself. As Pastor Jeremy said last week, through the words of Jesus, he is the narrow way. He is the door to the sheep. Jesus is the gate. Sinners are outside the gate. Only the righteous are inside of the gate. And the only way to get through the gate is through being covered by the righteousness of Christ. Our righteousness is but filthy rags, the Apostle Paul teaches us. We cannot come to the gates of righteousness and claim and roll out a list of all the good deeds and just have a hope that God grades on a curve and that we're not on the side of Hitler. You break the law, any level, you're a law breaker. And the consequence to breaking the law is judgment. And that judgment is death. Let me tell you the gospel. For those of you who've heard it, and know it, you know its sweetness, and you love to hear it again and again and again. For those who are saying, what must I do to see the kingdom? What must happen for me to see the kingdom? You need to see the world as God sees the world. You need to see the plan of salvation as God sees that plan. You see, God created the world, and in that world, he placed a garden. And God created man and placed man in that garden and gave him a purpose to tend that garden. And he gave that, God gave that man a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he held that man to perfect, perpetual obedience to that command. 
And God promised two things. This is a covenant. God promised two things. You keep the, man, the command perpetually, perfectly. I promise you a blessing and I promise you a curse. This is a covenant. The covenant made with Abraham. God promised, uh, I mean with Adam. God promised Adam life if he kept that commandment. If he did not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God promised the curse. And the curse is this. That Adam would die. If he didn't heed the command. And you know the story. Adam disobeyed God and he ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of Adam, because of that one man, sin and its consequences of death entered the world. And everyone from that man, born of natural conception, inherited Adam's sin nature. This is the original sin and we are corrupted through birth by that original sin. And because of that sin nature, sin proceeds from it. And our world is broken because of that sin. And every human being stands guilty before a holy and righteous God. And we know that he is holy. And we know that he is righteous. He is perfect in those attributes. And yet we crave justice in the face of sin. When we are in, caught in the consequences of another person's sin, we demand justice. But the problem is that if God gives us justice, we all die according to his decree, according to his law. But God. Say that again. But God. But God in his goodness and mercy sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus was not born of ordinary conception. He was born of a virgin. And yes, his virgin birth is essential. Why? Because if he's born of ordinary conception, he's born in sin. But because he's not born through ordinary conception, he's not born in sin. He's clean of sin. His record is clean, and throughout his life, Jesus keeps his record clean. He obeys perfectly the law of God. And because Jesus is fully God and fully man, he obeys the law of God to his heavenly Father's pleasure. And as a man, he obeys the law of God on our behalf. You see, Adam was the federal head of our sin nature. Christ became the federal head of our righteousness, of our sanctification. And God's plan for our salvation from original sin that we inherited from Adam, in, in God's plan of salvation, there are two imputations. The first imputation, the first exchange, is what imputation means. The first imputation is this, that at the cross of Calvary, God laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. He had no sin. But God laid the sin of all on Christ. Christ died for sin once for all. Christ the just died for the unjust, the likes of you and I. And God imputed our sin to Christ on that cross. And our sin was punished on that cross. Our sin was judged on that cross. Our sin was put to death on that cross. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. Christ died and don't ever forget this, for the First Presbyterian Church of Bakerstown. We're not a membership organization with rights and privileges. We are the saved people of God. And on the third day, after Christ died, God raised him from the dead. 
on that third day, and the second imputation occurred. Our sin was imputed, given to Christ, and on the resurrection day, which we will gather next Sunday to, to remember, in the resurrection, the righteousness of Christ is imputed, is given to us, is covered us. And the righteousness of Christ is given to all who profess belief in his resurrection with all of their heart. The righteousness of Christ is given to those who profess him as their Savior from sin and the Lord of their lives. There is a believing and there is a repenting. There is a believing in the resurrection. There is a believing in the saving lordship of Christ. And there is a repenting from sin. Sin no longer has a toehold on us. We are free from the power and the grip of sin because our faith in Christ causes us to run to him in the face of sin and abide in him that we might live as grafted branches into him who is the vine, that we might bear fruit that comes from his life given to us through us to bear the fruit that God desires. The imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer not only saves the believer from judgment on judgment day, it qualifies the believer for adoption into God's family. It qualifies the believer to be called a son or daughter of God. If you hear that everyone is children of God, that is a false teaching. The children of God are those who place their hope and faith in Christ. As sons and daughters, we are taught how we are reminded who we are every Sabbath day. As sons and daughters, we are taught how to live. And when we fail in keeping the words of the Lord, we are lovingly admonished through the grace of Christ, through the truth of Scripture, and the love of brother and sister for each other. We are lovingly admonished to repent of our erring ways. A dead church is a church where no one is admonished for any transgression against the word of the Lord. As sons and daughters, we are then given the purpose of the household of God as modeled by Jesus. No student is greater than his master, right? We have a purpose to call sinners to believe, repent, and follow Jesus as a disciple. And as we live into this purpose, we are further sanctified throughout this life, throughout our lifetime, by the very same gospel that saves us until one day when all is said and done, we're not just safe from the penalty of sin, we're safe from the power of sin, but one day we'll be completely holy glorified and saved from the very presence of sin in the new Jerusalem at the temple in the presence and full fellowship with a holy God worshiping with him with all of the saints and all of the heavenly creatures the cherubim the seraphim holy 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 are you O Lord That's the gospel. It's Jesus. He is the gate. The gate of righteousness. Through whom we gain access. To a kingdom. Now. And a kingdom that will be fulfilled when the Father sends Jesus at the end of days.
Know who you are today. Know who we can become together in Christ. Should we set our hearts to abide in him? I'll see you all on the third Sunday of July. If you don't know what that means, talk about that amongst yourselves. <laughs> Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for your word, for your word is life. Amen.